Welcome to Second Opinion, the reviews show here on The Nexus. I'm your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I will be joined by Brian Mitchell, who will be sharing his experiences with iOS 11. Find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash SO32. So, Brian. So, Ian. The, uh, the reason that I brought you on here is because, well, one, you're one of our resident Apple fanatics here at the Nexus, and I have had relatively limited experience with iOS 11. Obviously, I have it on the school iPad, but I use that device rather infrequently, uh, so I haven't, I haven't really explored around it a whole lot. Um, so I'm hoping that you can bring us some of that insider scoop. Yes. So this this version of iOS I installed maybe three weeks before the public release. I installed the public okay. beta. It was the uh, third or second to last beta. So maybe a month before. So I, I've been on it for a little while. Um, mm-hmm. Seen some changes going through. And I've been running the public betas the whole time. So I'm on 11.2 right now. Um, right. Yeah, my, my iPad just told me that it needs to update to 11.2. <laughs> was that out? Maybe it is out. I don't remember. I don't know. Either way, 11.1 has been out since iOS 11.0 came out. Mm -hmm. And by the way, iOS 11.0 came out on September 19th, which was Talk Like a Pirate Day. Yar. (laughs) (laughs) So there's some new features coming in later versions like um, peer-to-peer Apple Pay, um, which Mm. lets you send money to your friends and family through iMessage. Um, I haven't tested that out. I don't have any other people who I need to send money who are also running the beta, so... Right. And that's not like peer to peer as in like if you have two iPhones that are within range of each other they can just send money without being connected to the No, they internet. they'd need inter- person to okay. person. I guess. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um so let's uh let's start off with a real quick note about which devices iOS 11 is actually available for. Um on the iPhone side it's pretty simple just if you have a 5S or newer then uh then you can get iOS 11. Um, if you have the latest iPod Touch, which is the sixth generation one, which is uh, very, very old at this point, uh, that one's still supported. And then on the iPads, uh, we have the iPad Air and Air 2, the 2017 iPad, uh, which is the one that I have through school. Uh, and then for the iPad Minis, we have the Mini 2 and newer, uh, and then the iPad Pro. Yes, so that's the 9.7 and the newer 10.5, and then all the 12.9s, so. Okay. Oh, gosh, I forgot that there were different sizes of iPad Pro. There are a lot of iOS devices these days. Mm -hmm. So one of the big features that limits the amount of devices this is available for is that iOS 11 is 64-bit only. So if you have any apps that have not been updated to bring 64-bit compatibility in the last four years, then that app will simply not run. Apple started showing alerts when opening these apps with iOS 10.3, encouraging you to have the developer update it or for you to bug the Mm -hmm. developer to update it. So I lost, you know, maybe two apps that hadn't been updated in four years and, you know, a couple games that were sad, but it is what it is and I'm going to move forward. So um, that's actually a pretty important note, I think, because one of the one of the big issues in the video game space is like how do we preserve these older games that you know where the the systems that they're supposed to run on don't really exist anymore and in the mobile space that happens a lot quicker than you know like on the console or pc area so especially when we make this shift from 32 to 64 bit like there you go and especially as apple has been removing old and abandoned apps from the app store i think they've probably removed mm tens of thousands of apps or even a couple hundreds of thousands so Mm, mm -hmm. you know apps that haven't been updated since 2009 they're getting rid of a lot of that stuff Um, my guess is eventually in the future they're going to you know apps that were built for iphone os 2 will just not run on the newer i mean well clearly they won't the 64-bit thing kind of limits that actually so that means anything that is ios 6 and newer 7 when did 30, mm-hmm. I think the 5S came with 7. So iOS 7 and newer, only apps that are at least built for that will even run on iOS 11. So they are kind right. of cleaning up some of the older things in their OS. So, you know, they can remove 32-bit support. I'm sure they're not done with that at this moment, but, you know, they're working on it. And um, some older APIs that have been deprecated but still supported because you could could still run an iPhone OS 2 app 
on iOS 10. So mm. my guess is they're just trying to clean up some things a little bit and yeah. move forward rather than have to support everything. And for those like apps that you know go away from the app store is there anybody who's like you know is does the internet archive have like a repository of these old apps because i i know that like on android you can just you know grab an apk and then like you know keep it forever but like i don't i don't even know what ios apps would no i don't think there's there's no central place um you know you can't install an app that's not through the app store without jailbreaking and jailbreaking Mm -hmm. is really really going down the drain there's just I just don't think there's many features that you need to get through jailbreaking and you know it's just the world's kind of changing and yeah it's unfortunate but yeah we need to, yeah we need to preserve this legacy you know that's definitely important I think that your best bet is to have an older iOS device and download all the apps you want on there and just leave it in a drawer <laughs> There you go museums invest in old iOS devices Yeah so some of the more noticeable things in iOS 11 when you first use it is there's a new visual style to the to the OS. It's not quite yep. as drastic as iOS 6 to iOS 7, but it's right. subtle changes that, that kind of affect things. Some more notable ones are the titles in navigation controllers. So if you go to like your settings app, you'll see this big old settings text and then some white space mm. around it. And that's, you know, a larger, more bold. Huge text. header. And and did do those like integrate the search bar into them or something like that? I think I saw. I think I read that somewhere. Yeah, at least the settings app does that. Let me try to find okay. another app. Notes has that. Yeah, I I would imagine you can disable that, but it looks like at least all of Apple's built-in apps do that. Cool. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't know that. Cool. Notification center is redesigned. So now, if you're on your phone or your, I guess more your phone. I'm more familiar with the the phone parts than the iPad. Swipe down from your wherever you are, and you get notification center. But it looks very much like mm-hmm. the lock screen, and that's their new intention. And because then, then you can swipe to the left and get all of your widgets, and you can swipe to the right and get your camera, just like you were you would if you were on oh, the lock screen. Oh, so it's, hey, so it's kind of swiping down. To, now it doesn't lock your phone, but it right. it does bring you to that same kind of state. So that's kind of a good shortcut to quickly get to the camera. Swipe down, swipe yeah, to yeah. the left. And this is an example of one of the things that I made note of is that like the the kind of frosted glass yes. appears in fewer places. It's not gone completely, but it, it appears in way fewer places than it used to. Because I believe that when you pulled down the notification drawer in iOS 10, it would kind of frosted glass the rest, you know, the app that you were currently in. Yeah. And now it just gives you like that that wallpaper in the background. Yeah, I think they're they're stacking more and blurring less now another new thing which we'll talk about later control center that they they blur the heck out of the background so mm. it's not everywhere but another another thing that a user might notice pretty right away pretty much right away is the cellular indicators are now bars again they're not the five dots that came with ios 7 and i think that's a lot largely due to the iphone 10 having less real estate on the status bar so mm. bars are smaller okay uh, app open and close animations are changed. So if you're in an app, for example, TweetBot, if you hit exit, the bottom pixels of the little blue robot mouth thing on their app icon are kind of stretched as you close the app. So the app will fade from the content of the app. It'll add rounded corners and then will kind of morph into the app icon and it then will shrink and compress down to the app icon. So it looks like each app is going back to where it came on the home screen. Mm-hmm. Whereas before it did something else, and I can't remember what that was. So the the biggest change that I've noticed with that animation is that when you open an app from the home screen, what used to happen was all of the icons that were like next to it would expand, zoom away, you know, uh, as right, yep. as the app preview expands to fill the screen. And now what happens is the home screen just kind of does this kind of it it kind of like fades away from you as the other app kind of expands towards you. And then when you close the app to go back to home, it's, it does the inverse of that. Yep. It kind of, it goes out in front, layers the content rather than moving mm-hmm. it. Kind of like the yep. the glass, you know, it's stacking versus pushing or I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember a lot of people kind of like 
freaking out about how much movement there was when they first introduced that that zoom animation yeah. and so uh, it's prob- probably a good thing for them to switch away from that to something else well there is the accessibility feature for reducing motion and that will introduce ah, yeah. more fades and less wild animations mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. many of the system apps have new app icons so that's I mean, that's not really indicative of a wider, like, style change that they're trying to introduce. You know, that they're they're not, like, trying to encourage third-party app developers to follow, like, you know, some, some new design scheme. But it's just, you know, kind of a new touch. They're mostly pretty subtle changes. So I think the settings app is just, you know, tweak some of the, the shadows and colors. Mm-hmm. Um, the App Store and iTunes Store are more noticeable. They yeah they lost their older style, and you know the the App Store icon, which used to be what was it a ruler, a paintbrush, and a pencil, is now just something like that. Now just bars in the same shape, so it looks familiar and recognizable. But right, it's no longer, and it has like that bold. It has a bold blue background. Yeah, uh, on the app icon now, and like the Maps app changes their icon to where Apple's new headquarters are, so you see the spaceship. It used to be near the <laughs> and now it's near their spaceship. I think the Context app got a new icon. The Reminders app camera was maybe tweaked a little bit. Yeah, iTunes Store. That's all that I can think of for now. Calculator maybe got a new icon. The whole Calculator yep. app got a redesign. And there was a bug until iOS 11.1 as well that meant that the animation would block touches. So if you typed like 1 plus 2 plus 3 equals, it would not be 6. It would be... It would say 23 because you would hit two and the mm-hmm. plus would not fire because you were typing too fast. Something like right. that. Right. And I can't even try it now because they fixed it. So, <laughs> Right, exactly. And then I, I made this note that like kind of buttons and UI elements, especially like I noticed this in the app store itself, is they, they kind of feel like more solid to me. So like, you know, the... You know, when you're on like the updates page, for example, in the in the app store, the the button next to each app that says update used to be kind of like this transparent background with the with the text on it. Right. And now it it feels like that the text is a little bit more bold uh, and the button has kind of like a light gray, you know, background to it. So it, it, it feels like. A, a solid object there on the screen as opposed to i don't know before it kind of felt like it was a part of the background as well yeah and i've seen a bug on my ipad too of that update screen so you know how it says it's the rounded rectangle gray background with the blue text it says update yeah the background will spin <laughs> with the label oh. staying there or oh boy. You know, when it says update now i think that's because when it is updating or you know there's an animation before it starts downloading where it's just kind of spinning and then mm-hmm. it starts loading the progress bar as it's updating, and then it it should just then oh, transform okay. to open. But there's some bug with the animation there where it causes the whole entire background to spin instead. So I, I haven't funny. seen it lately. I've only ha- had it happen to me once, but I've seen other things on Twitter as well. So it's moderately common, I guess. All right, so that's uh, that's it for visual style. The dock on the iPads has a pretty significant like change to it i don't know if this applies to iphone or not so let me know nope it's just ipad yep just ipad okay so usually what the dock used to be was just like you chose you know like a few apps that would go down there and they're like they're always there they don't scroll as you scroll through the rest of the home screen but now they have kind of this tiny little section off to the right where it's like three or four different uh recently used or like frequently used apps you know that that it like the iPad thinks that you're going to want to open up again yep. pretty soon. And it does a pretty good job of, of, you know, selecting which apps I'm most likely to use next. But also the dock, and this goes into the next thing that we're going to talk about as well, is there's a few like kind of gestures that they've added in for iOS 11 that kind of remind me of like the iPhone 10. So these are, again, these are iPad only. These are big multitasking. Yeah. And before you leave the dock, I'm just going to real quick say you can put more icons in the dock. So... You can mm. really load that up, um, and then you get your three most recently used as well. So the whole thing scales, um, and so you can have some pretty small icons, so much like a dock on macOS. So for those multitasking features and gestures, on the iPad, if no matter what app I'm in, I can swipe up from the bottom of the screen to get to my dock, 
which is super useful. But also if I continue swiping up from there, then it brings me to the app switcher uh, screen, which is also combined with the control center on the on the iPad. And I think that this is a great, great change because like having just having all of those tools all in one place is pretty awesome. Yeah, it's like your one-stop shop for everything you need while you're in an application. Yeah. And also, this is where you go now to do, like, the split view apps. Also, if you have, like, two different apps open in split view and you go to the app switcher, that those two apps, like, stay together in one spot, kind of like having a virtual desktop on macOS yeah. that has multiple different full screen apps, like, next to each other. Yeah, great, great additions, great changes for... Um, it did take me a little while to figure out how to get to split screen again because like you know i was using the the ipad in class and i'm like trying to swipe in from the right hand side of the screen and i'm like why can't i why can't i get another app open <laughs> yeah and you could do some interesting things too where if you have a uh, an app open or if you're in your home screen you can tap and hold on an app icon and then open another app and then release the hold and it'll kind of put that other app over the 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 one you just opened so there's oh that sounds complicated. They're adding new drag and drop features into it as well. I haven't really figured out the entire thing. I still can't figure out how to change my slide over app. <laughs> so there's there's still some uh, difficult um, functionality for a user to learn. Mm -hmm. Now I think these features are all way more tailored towards power users, and that's that's really great because then they can get more out of the iPad. Right. Yeah. Now, in that same kind of view, um, Control Center got a lot of love as well in iOS 11. So mm -hmm. on the iPad, as, as Ian just said, it's kind of next to your, your apps switcher and your recently used apps, where on iPhone, it's again swipe up from the bottom, but now it's kind of a full screen thing with a very blurred background, and they completely re redesigned the whole thing. It's now much more customizable. They have way more actions that you can add add to it, and they're all there's more uh, dynamic things. So... For example, you're, you have a brightness slider. Instead of just being a, a standard uh, slider that you swipe and you hold left and right with a little dot that indicates where it is, it's now a kind of a, a rounded rectangle a vertical thing that you just tap and hold to you know, increase or decrease the brightness, and it kind of animates mm -hmm. larger as you do it. You can also 3D touch on that. It fills the whole screen, and you have an option to do night shift. You know, A lot of these you can yeah. 3D touch and do more. Um, they have... you know. The, the music widget thing can, you can, from the main part, you can see what's playing in a pretty small label. Play, go forward, go next. Um, and then you can expand that and connect to um, other devices, so AirPlay devices or other Bluetooth devices. Um, and there's another volume slider in there. Then there's on the left-hand side, at least on iPhone by default, you have your airplane mode, cellular, data, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth. And if you 3D touch on there, um, you get additional things like AirDrop and Personal Hotspot, and even get a label for the which Wi-Fi network you are connected to. Um, there's just a ton of these widgets uh, that are quite nice, and you can really customize them, add them. You can just have a couple things if you want, or all of them, and, and you have to scroll through Control Center, and it's quite nice. No complaints here. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a great. Like I think that the most powerful part of that is that you can go into the Settings app and change which items you have in your control center mm -hmm. you know um because not everybody is going to need this quick access to all of the exact same things so yeah like now i'll say my one actually i, I did have one complaint <laughs> uh the the music controls uh while they're they're nice here they're i think a little too small the the touch targets are just a little too close together and mm. um, I have to do I have to touch into that interface to be able to get to Bluetooth devices and things and when I'm listening to music or podcasts or whatever at work I oftentimes need to reconnect my headphones because I walk to the bathroom or stop for an hour for lunch or something like that and so I have mm -hmm. I'm often having to reconnect and it's just an extra tap into it to get there where I think I was 10 and below it was kind of right on the main screen in control center yeah Yep, yep, yep. We now have, for the very first time in iOS, a quote unquote like file explorer. You can you can go and explore some folders and see, well, okay, not really. Well, so 
in iOS 10, at least, there was an app called iCloud Drive, which is pretty much, I think, the files app. Now, I want to say it was disabled by default, but you could, in some settings, huh. enable it and then the app icon would show up. Uh, but now it has definitely been much more expanded because you have mm-hmm. other locations that you can add. So you have your iCloud Drive, but then third-party applications can have extensions that build into the files app. So on my yep, phone, like for I example... I have Google Drive that shows up. Yeah, Google Drive, Dropbox, um, Working Copy, which is a Git client on my phone, Transmit, um, an SFTP um, file transfer app, and then uh, DS File, which is f- to access my Synology NAS at my house so I can just pick files off my NAS in the files app. Um, and you can tag things, um, search around. They now let you sort by folders, whereas mm-hmm. in iOS 10 and below, they literally showed you a single list of every file in the hierarchy. Oh, boy. View. So, you know, things would be... Uh, they'd have margins on the left as they'd be kind of indented in, but you had to scroll through that entire list of all your files. And so if you had a, if you stored everything in iCloud Drive, you would never be able to find anything. And so they have folders now... Um, in iCloud, at least, if your folder is from an application, it'll show the little app icon on that. So like GarageBand or Keynote pages, numbers, mm-hmm. things like that. Now, I would like to note something that I was, when I first saw this, I was totally expecting it, but it is not present. Um, you still can't just like like long press on things in the browser and just download them, right? We don't have a downloads folder. And it's insane. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, so if I'm in Safari on the iPad and not in Chrome on the iPad, it gives me a share button, and then one of the items in there is save to files. Oh. And then I can choose, you know, iCloud Drive or Drive or whatever. Was that in the bottom row of share buttons? Yes. Ah, that's why I missed it. Okay. Yeah. But I can't do that from Chrome on the iPad. Bug Google, not Apple. (laughs) Copy link URL. Yeah, and I think that's you know that's a thing of using first party versus third party. Google might try to share it to Google Drive. Well, Google won't let me. It won't let you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that could be limitations to the um, the WK web uh, shoot. Uh, I don't even remember WK view controller. Nope. Uh, Safari can whatever the API class is. That mm-hmm. thing that Chrome wraps around because Chrome on iOS is really WebKit and Safari underneath with a right. Google wrapper around it, so it has yep. the features and can sync with Chrome and what yada yada yada. Yep, yep, yep. Weird stuff. Weird stuff. I'm glad to see that they do have a just save to file as part of the share menu. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, what are these letters here that we have <laughs> written down? H E I F slash H E V C. So that is the high efficiency image format and high efficiency video codec. So on iOS 11, you can record videos in 4K at 60 frames per second, but you have to use the new H E V C video codec, which is the H265 codec. Um, previously, everything's been using H264 for the last decade and a half. And mm-hmm. before that, H263 was used. Um, and then images as well, you can save as um, HEIF format instead of H or instead of JPEG. So that that means that you can have better quality with the same files, file sizes, or um, uh, the same or the same quality with lower file sizes. So okay. just more efficient image and video compression algorithms. Uh, now this reduces compatibility with other apps, so apps have to add support to work with these. Um, basically, they just need to probably rebuild their application because Apple adds support for it in their core image and core video and all of their system frameworks. So when you say that you can save images in these formats, does that mean like when you take a picture or a video with the camera, or do you mean like if you grab it from some other device and it, it can? Nope. Like so it's transcribe it's an option. it from JPEG into. It's an option in settings. When you take the photo, it takes it as HEIF. Okay. And okay. Has so it only applies H-E-I-F to extension. stuff from the camera. Yep. So stuff that is created okay. on that device. Um, I still have the old way enabled. I don't know when I'll move over, but. Hmm. Um, I think when I get a newer iPhone, I'll probably use the new new stuff, just because the camera will be better and can do higher resolution. I don't know. It might take advantage of it more. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I think in the iPhone 7 and newer, there's hardware. Now, this, yeah, this can't be done on all devices because it is more 
hardware intensive because it has to compute more when you're saving it because it is yeah. better compression. Um, so only certain devices can support it. I think it's the 7 and newer. Maybe it's the 6S and newer. Mm, 7 and newer, I think. So it needs some hardware-based um, acceleration for it. And it's kind of a similar story on the Mac as well. So uh, Mac OS High Sierra 10.13 added support for this as well. And it's only Macs made, I think, 2015, maybe even 16 and newer can support it without being CPU bound. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Um, drag and drop API. So th- I love the sound of that. So this kind of plays into the new multitasking gestures and things on the iPad. So you can kind of drag and drop apps around and kind of explode them into or on top of another app. But it's mm-hmm. uh, much more than that. You can select text and things. So anything that um, an app developer has deemed drag and droppable, they okay. can associate a bunch of metadata with it and whatnot and file types and everything. Um, and so then you can drag things from one app to another on iPad. So if you have two in split view, you can kind of drag one to the other. Now on mm-hmm. iPhone, it's limited to within an app. So um, a good example I know of is in Overcast 4, um, you can reorder by dragging and dropping the podcasts in a list. So if you want to change the order of your playlist, you just kind of drag hold for a short time for it to start the drag and drop action. And then you just swipe up and drop it where you want in the list um so mm. all kind of table views by default when you make them um have that little edit button and then there's a little you know that little minus sign comes in so you can delete stuff yeah and there's that little the three bars on the right hand side of every cell that you can kind of drag up and down so that's kind of replaced with drag and drop so you can just drag and drop it where you want rather than having to kind of go into a special edit and reorder mode but it lets you copy um, images and text, and it's it's uh-huh. quite nice and powerful, I think. Yeah, being an Android user, that whole like having to go into a specific edit mode to like change stuff around in a in a list has always like thrown me off <laughs> whenever I encounter it. Because um, yeah, generally on on Android, you just long press on stuff and then you can drag them around. So yeah, so it's similar to that. Um, yeah, we have new emojis in iOS. Uh, looks like eleven point one is when they came, not with iOS eleven point zero. Yeah. Um, but we've been updated to the emoji five point zero Unicode standard, um, which is good. Yeah, good, good. And I think Apple's been releasing emoji as a second update to the OS. I think it's a good way to mm. get a bunch of people onto the OS, stress test it, fix any huge glaring bugs, and then introduce emoji and get everyone moved over. Oh, yeah, because that's where the appeal is nowadays, apparently. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> the appeal for the developer crowd, of course, uh, has been ARKit, because um, that, that, that's their new augmented reality, like, kind of API set, yes? Yep, exactly. That- so you can um, use ARKit with the camera and and kind of experience the world in 3D just through the camera. So there's uh, a cool app that kind of exemplifies this called measure kit and you can like use your camera mark points and measure distances between things just using the camera it's super cool um i don't it's not like 100 percent accurate but it's pretty good um right i know some other uses of this the ikea app lets you point in your room and drop in ikea furniture in in your room so you can see how stuff looks before you go out and buy it nice that's, nice that's pretty cool um, what is this core ML? I don't recognize so that is this. Apple's uh, framework for machine learning. Uh, so you can, uh, an example is you can put your camera at something and it will tell you what it is. So mm. it's a built, some built in data sets for recognizing objects. And um, there's some other things for, you can feed it uh, data and build models that it can then um, compute things for you. And right, because machine learning isn't just isn't just limited to like image recognition. Yep. Uh, so there's way more you could go into about that. I don't know too much about it, so you'll just have to use your imagination or go ask Brandon. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll have to have him on to talk about machine learning sometime. Maybe on an extra dimension episode. Ooh, that'd be good. Yeah. The camera app can now read QR codes natively. Yes, I've never tried this, but supposedly it does that. 
Uh, I feel like this was something I heard was going to come to iOS many years ago, and then it never did. I don't know. It yeah, like it's, it's 2017. I can't believe that it's taken this long for both Google and Apple to build in QR code scanning as you know a system level thing. Yeah, I do think the idea of a QR code is a little silly sometimes because you have to you walk by something. Oh, you have to pull out your phone, position it, open the camera thing, and then open it. You know, I think something like a a little NFC tag or something is a lot easier, but true true but until recently iphones didn't have nfc yeah yeah i mean i can tell you that in the in the classroom setting it's very very useful to have qr codes because especially on like you know the the first day of school before you know everybody has like gotten settled into you know schoology and everything like i could just get them all a link to you know a google drive folder or something like that just by putting a qr code up on the wall yeah and then it's more fun and gets people on their feet Mm-hmm. Yep. 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 Uh so you can now use iCloud Keychain and other apps through a Safari View controller. So um Okay, so that sounds like a bunch of buzzwords to me. I don't understand. So iCloud Keychain is something Apple introduced in I think iOS nine for storing passwords and usernames. Um so now in Safari View Controller, um through other apps you can, you know, log into a service. So say you download a new Twitter app because those are all the rage. And you will mm-hmm. need to log into Twitter. So you can pull up a thing that will, that will sign into Twitter. Now, you are in the other app, but it's through the Safari View Controller. Okay. And then you can log in with the iCloud keychain stored username and password. And then you th- sign in, and then you are signed into the app. So it's more of a, okay. a helpful way to have all of your passwords if you store them through Apple. So those... Okay, so the keychain was previously only accessible when you were in like safari proper is that correct yes now okay i'm second guessing myself maybe this icloud keychain maybe you can use it in just a standard login and password field in an app if the app supports it because um the password tool one password has Mm -hmm. a little app extension that developers can add to their app so you click the little one password icon and then it pulls up um one password and you can just tap your username password and then it fills it into the app and that's not using safari or anything at all right 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 right. this might be like that i feel like i've seen this used in a couple of places but i can't remember their specificness of it either way let's use your icloud keychain in more places and that's handy yeah yeah (laughs) i'm surprised that they didn't make the icloud keychain yeah like a like a system-wide thing where it just automatically detects even if the even if the app developer hasn't gone and like specified you know, this is a username and password field. Apple, please, you know, f- fill these in. Um, you know, you should be able to kind of like guess based on a number of factors. Like, oh, this looks like it's a username and password. Well, you don't want to, you don't quite yeah, want to do that because yeah, it right. has to be in the user only area because if the app has any access to any of that, then they suddenly have the user's username and password to something. So Right, right. Yeah, but I, I I mean I suppose if in the case where you're not like where it's not so 100% sure if this is a username and password, it can probably prompt like, "Hey user, is are you trying to put it in this username and password? What what app do you want to use?" You know, like Yeah. Well, yeah. I think on iOS apps are updated frequently enough that Apple is saying telling developers to specifically add support for this in is uh not unheard of at all. Um I mm-hmm. think that would seem logical to me. Yeah, but. yeah. All right, this next one really excites me. Screen recording and replay kit. Yeah, so in uh, Control Center, there is a new feature for screen recording. Now, this was off by default, but you can turn it on in settings, and you can just record your screen. It's pretty cool. It's It just works. It There's nothing to it. Um, it's great. Uh, before this, you would have to plug your device into a computer with QuickTime and then create a new screen recording through that device um Hmm. and that's been there since ios 8 ios 9 maybe and before that you had to jailbreak so okay uh it's pretty handy for that and for reporting bugs and things for app developers and then replay kit is a a feature for games so you can um save something in a game and then replay it uh i haven't used this but it's it's kind of like screen recording but in a game right and being able to share that and things. Very cool. Very cool. 
Uh, do not disturb while driving. So it sounds like this is the kind of thing where it you you tell it like when I connect to this particular Bluetooth device, this is a car, and please go into do not disturb. Yep. Or if I'm above uh, a certain speed. So mm. there are two options that you can do. Um, maybe there's a third one for just always manual. Um, let me check on that. Either way, it's it's quite handy to be able to know that you're not going to get alerted with things while driving and getting distracted. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, yeah, so you can do activate automatically, which is speed-based when connected to car Bluetooth and manually. Um, and then when you are in do not disturb mode while driving, which is a little different than normal do not disturb, um, you can have it auto-reply to text messages. Um, huh. And so you can set if it should auto-reply to either no one, recents, favorites, or all contacts. And then you mm-hmm. can set the auto reply message. The default one is I'm driving with do not disturb while driving turned on. I'll see your messages when I get where I'm going. <laughs> and you can change that. This message sent to you from my iPhone. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> um, and then they will also get a, a message saying that if it's something they really need to contact you about, they can use the word urgent and then it um, as an addis- as an additional message and then it'll actually send it through. Hmm. So I do mine activate on Bluetooth, so it only activates while I'm in my car, and I have it set to favorites. I had it set to recents, but then I was feeling very um, Apple-y when it was just auto-replying to everyone I was t- talking to, basically. So I turned that back to favorites. Do they, so on the on the automatically activating at a certain speed, can you like adjust that speed at all? Because, you no. know, my maximum biking speed is uh, a little bit less than my maximum driving speed. <laughs> yes. Now I do think it's about 20 miles an hour maybe. So I think okay. when you are biking, it can be activated. And that's something I was mm-hmm. like, eh, I'll do car Bluetooth instead. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, emergency SOS. What is that? So this is a feature that will uh, dial emergency services. So nine one one here in the U.S. If you hit the power button five times, then it comes up with it. Actually locks your phone, so it disables Touch ID. You need to type in your passcode again, and there's slide to power off medical ID or emergency SOS. Mm. Um, and so this is a way of locking your phone. So um, this came up a bit this last uh, winter. Um, when the um, there was a lot of concern about coming in and out of the U.S. and getting checked by border control and things. Um, yeah. So if you want to lock down your phone and make it much more difficult for anyone to get into it, um, hitting that power button five times will lock it, disable Touch ID, um, because I think there, there are different laws around can you force someone to put their finger on a certain spot on their phone versus can you force them to, to type in a password. So this... Uh, can lock that and as well there's an emergency sos part on it as well now right. this this is on uh the apple watch as well and i i triggered it once and then i realized it immediately and stopped calling 911 but i, I like <laughs> i had some i was doing some lighting work and so i had a, like a little light electrician glove on and it held the button long enough and then i got this blaring alarm sound and looked and it was calling 911 so i hit cancel real quick it never went through all the way, but good, good. That would have been an interesting conversation. I'm sure it's not. I'm sure they get it like fairly often, right? I would imagine just in the the modern smartphone days, people are are pocket dialing nine one one all the time. I bet. Hmm. Uh, Wi Fi sharing. This was this announced for like recently for like between MacBooks and iPhones. So you're thinking of sharing Wi Fi networks through iCloud Keychain or okay. iCloud. Uh, that is a little different than this. So this is if you have connected to a Wi-Fi network recently and someone who is in your contacts opens the Wi-Fi screen, you can just, you get an alert on your phone and you can say, allow to the network. And so oh. then it sends that password over to their phone and then they are logged in. So it's basically letting you give someone access to your network without giving them your password. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of handy. And you know, then you don't have to type it out or tell it to them, or if it's confusing, like my network, but like my password is, then you don't have to sit through two minutes of, what do you mean? What do you mean? What did you say? Right. So. Yeah. That's always a challenge is when you have like guests over, it's like, how do you quickly just communicate with them what your Wi-Fi, like how to get onto your Wi-Fi? Um, 
Because some people will ask and some people won't, but like most people, you know, do want it. Yeah. But you know, like it's, ugh. yeah. Um, you know, it'd be cool is if like, uh, you know, like Chromecast or Apple TV or things like that. You know, if if you can just tell it like, all right, put up the Wi-Fi name and password that you have. You know. Oh yeah. Stored on there, and then yeah. There you go. Just don't get anyone looking through your windows. True. 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 All right, another another new little feature is for screenshots. So when you screenshot, which is the standard um, home and power button, at least on phones that are not the iPhone 10, I don't remember the action for the iPhone 10. Um, it you know flashes green white, takes a photo, but instead of just going directly to the Photos app, it now kind of goes down to the bottom left of your screen, and then you can edit it with Markup Kit, which is new in iOS 10, I think, mm-hmm. and then. Um, you can share it directly from there. And then once you share it and you hit done, you can just delete the photo. So if you just want to take a screenshot, send it somewhere and then get rid of it, you totally can do that now. You don't have to take it, go to the Photos app, share it, and then go delete the photo in Photos. It just never saves nice. it in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you can add like... Yeah, because most times, most times people don't want to keep their screenshots forever and ever. Yeah. So you can, you can do things like add text, signatures, a magnifier, um, sh- shapes, so like you know, circles, squares, um, speech bubbles, arrows. You can mark on it with like a, a marker, a pen, a pencil, an eraser. You can lasso s- stuff and change the colors. It's mm-hmm. a pretty good feature. You can crop it. Yeah. So when you say that it, when you take the screenshot, like the screenshot kind of goes down the lower left-hand corner, is that like a picture-in-picture kind of thing? Yep. It looks very much like that. Okay. And then it looks like we're going to be finishing off here talking about a few redesigns in some of the system level apps, the yes. built-in well, apps. Well, there, there are two more things that aren't apps. I'm realizing maybe we should talk about that first. Um, okay. The first one being the keyboard, which... I mean, technically keyboards are kind of apps now, right? <laughs> yes, you can definitely have a keyboard app. Um, and as we found out during these show notes, you can also have an app that makes it look like it's adding to the keyboard, but it's really not the keyboard at all. Yeah. <laughs> Super weird. So um, some of these fe- or the first feature here is only on iPad. So there's something called a key flick. So if you open up the keyboard on an iPad, um, before iOS 11, you just have your number or your letters and that was all. But now you have little gray um, letters or numbers or symbols above each character. And if you just tap and flick down, you can get that character. So it, it makes typing like an address really easy because you can just do like one, two, three, four, get your address on on that top row, the QWERTY row to get your numbers and you just start typing the, the name of the street as well. Um, you can get special characters that way um, in addition and it's handy. You don't have to hit the, um, the key that gets you to the special symbols and numbers as often. Yeah. Because for the longest time, that was one thing that I always preferred about most Android keyboards over the built-in iOS keyboard was that it was so much easier to type in stuff with, you know, special characters or numbers or whatever because you didn't have to leave that home keyboard layout. Um, But uh, in this case right now, Apple just leapfrogged those approaches because most of those were long press on the key in order to get to like the number or the extra symbol or whatever um but like flicking is way faster than long pressing and you you know you still don't need to worry about like accidentally activating that right because like flicking down is is a pretty hard to do on accident yeah i think there is some app kind of like this only was flicking up on jailbroken iphones so I used to have mm. something like this on my iPhone back in iOS, I don't know, five, six, something like that. And that was quite handy. And I kind of wish it came to the iPhone, but that would be a lot of, they'd cramp a lot into a little bit on the phone. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I have, I've had those extra, extra symbols on my keyboard, on my phone, at least for the number row for quite a while. And it, it doesn't make it too cluttered. Yeah. Um, there is a setting where you can have every single letter have another symbol associated with it that you can long press for, and that beca- that looks pretty cluttered. Yeah, I can imagine. But, um, but yeah, if it, if if it was just the number row on the iPhones, I think it would be. I think that would be a good thing. Yeah. Well, they added it for iPad. We'll see if it comes to iOS or to iPhone as well. Mm-hmm. 
Um, in addition to Keyflex, um, you can now do autofill for apps. So if you're in a password or in a, like an address or an email or a name prompt, um, in the quick type little bar for suggestions, you can just tap your email and you could swipe over. And if you have multiple emails in your contact, you can select which one. And it's super handy. I've used, I use that a lot. Um, so, you know, in like a form in Safari or something, you know, you know, the HTML says this is an address input or something. And so you get yeah. an address. And so um, that's super handy. It lets you, you know, autofill like you can in a des- desktop web browser, but without it autofilling everything, which um, right. you can have which like sometimes a hidden... bites you in the butt. You can have like a hidden input with some extra fields that the user wouldn't nece- necessarily know about on a computer. And you would be able to send that with... Um, whereas um, here you're choosing per input. Mm-hmm. Um, you can also get emoji suggestions. So if you type something like um, a cat, you'll get a cat emoji come up or a pumpkin, a pumpkin or a turkey. And so it you can um, insert emojis when you're typing without having to go to the emoji picker and scroll through and find what you're looking for. I use that a lot. Um, you can also change the language of dictation without changing the keyboard first. So before dictation was tied to the keyboard and now dictation is more on its own hmm. um interesting i don't use dictation very much and especially not in other languages but good for those who do and there's a one-handed keyboard mode on iphone so this was something leaked by steve Stroughton smith a couple of years ago um, it's just a keyboard that is a little more squished i think it matches the same size as the iphone 5 keyboard because i already had that built so it just lets mm. you kind of squish the keyboard a little bit to the right or the left of your screen depending on which side you want it so you can type a little more easily with one hand yep that's a good feature i have i have that set up on my uh on my android phone yeah makes gesture typing actually doable with one thumb yeah. all right and our last kind of system level thing here is siri so siri got a new and improved voice um it sounds much much more realistic now um i think there's a little more uh functionality that it can maintain its state across multiple messages um, so it can know what, what you're talking about in the next question rather mm. than resetting every time. Which is pretty key for, like, conversation flow. Yeah. Now, I do think Siri is still behind that of, like, Google Home or Google Voice. Google Assistant. Google Assistant. There we go. Thank you. Um, but I don't know. They're making some progress, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. There are now Siri suggestions in Safari. So if you type something, kind of how uh, when you search in Google, Google often puts a card that kind of summarizes what you're searching in the top mm-hmm. um, this is kind of uh, the same thing only it's saying it's from siri and this is before you even hit the search so it's kind of doing it for you as you type it uh, there are better quick type suggestions um, based on your conversations and what you usually will be saying to others um, you can type to siri so if you're in the siri screen and you want to ch- change what you dictated or you just want to type it out you can do that um, and there's siri kit for to do's and notes so apps can now so note apps and to-do apps can now um, add Siri in. So you can say, um, you can say, hey, Siri, uh, add this to my to-do list in whatever to-do app if you want. Yeah. Hey, I triggered Siri. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So on the on the um, quick note about the, the typing to Siri, I'm super glad that most of these companies that like went hard on the voice recognition you know you're going to be talking to your assistant from now on kind of you know realized that most people do not want to talk to the assistant every single time that they want to interact with it and so they're building in just typing now as well as an option so the more options just makes it more versatile yeah exactly yeah (laughs) um all right so now we got a few a few of the apple apps that uh have been been uh, revamped um starting with the podcast app which uh you know is definitely relevant to us because hey people are probably using that to listen to this yeah so uh, this app got um a new visual redesign so it's kind of the card style design just like the music app got in ios 10 Mm -hmm. Um, and then apple added some new features to podcasts in general so oftentimes with podcasting the Apple iTunes pod, or now it's called Apple Podcast Directory. It's kind of the the one true um, source for all podcasts. Now there are, there are others popping up, but Apple's has been around the longest, and it's probably the most complete. 
Um, and they kind of, the guidelines that they give for podcasters kind of shape the entire industry, really. Yeah. You know? Um, so, like, the, the industry standard for what album art sizes you can expect, for what kinds of RSS tags you can expect to see, you know, that kind of stuff. That's all, like, Apple's doing. Yeah. And everybody else kind of follows suit. They kind of developed the, the open spec. Mm -hmm. Now, because it is open, anyone can do anything, and it's all fine. But Apple kind of guides where it is going as well. So they added the concept yep. of a season, um, as well as a trailer and bonus episodes. So kind of, I think they're really pushing, you know, stories and seasons of things, much like a TV yeah, show. Yeah, serialized but, content. Yeah, exactly. So yep. I think that's... Or, sorry, so episodic content. Yeah, okay, there we go. Yeah. So I think that's a good, good feature. So other apps will have to implement this as time goes on, and podcasts will have to add that to them as well so yep. um yep, yep. i've heard some complaints about the podcast app most mostly from my parents that it's confusing and they don't quite understand it i use it a little bit and i was able to figure my way around but i didn't have tons of podcasts in there and i hadn't really used it in years so mm -hmm. i don't know i've been doing a lot of research on different podcast players you know because we have at some point uh we're going to have a an entire episode here on second opinion where we are reviewing all different podcast apps that are out there and they keep freaking changing so i keep having to go back and like <laughs> re-research each one yeah uh hopefully that episode doesn't you know end up going into like podcast purgatory or something like that it'll just be a four-hour episode as we talk about every yeah, single uh, one Gosh, uh, I'm looking forward to it so much. It's going to be great. <laughs> I'll take a nap halfway through. Maps, the maps, the Apple Maps, map, apps. Map, 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 map. So there's map, some new map, features. Map. Uh, when you are getting uh, guidance, so when you're on uh, getting directions to some location, you'll now get lane guidance. So it'll tell you, take the left two mm. lanes or take the right lane. Um, that's handy. Google Maps has had that for a little while. So it's good yeah. to see it come here. And there's also speed limit indications. So they show a little sign with a little speed limit 60 or whatever it is. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I've always wondered why like none of our mapping applications have had that feature up until now. Because oftentimes, you know, you go for miles and miles in between speed limit, like physical signs. Uh, yeah. Um, they have indoor mapping in a few select locations. So I think it's mm -hmm. only in like the U.S., uh, Japan, and one other country, maybe with some few a few airports and malls. So they've mapped out the insides here, so you can say I'm on the first floor or second floor, and what are the stores or where are the right the gates and things. So that's kind of handy. Um, and lastly, there's still no cycling routing, so I still have to use Google <sighs> Maps when I want to say I want to bike to here. How do I get there? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would be using Apple Maps all the time. Yep. Yep. But then, Ryan, you wouldn't be able to see Ryan and I, our, our locations. It's a worthy trade-off. That's probably impacting my battery moderately significantly anyway, but mm. <laughs> I use Find My Friends too, so I'm just sharing my location everywhere with both platforms. Yep, pretty much. And uh, and on Snapchat, apparently, right? That's a thing too. Oh, that's right. Yeah, every time you open the app. Yep, I don't have that disabled, so you can find me there as well. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the music app. Yeah, so Apple Music. Uh, with iOS 10, they added the they added two playlists that were kind of automatically curated by whatever algorithm they do. So they had a favorites mix and a new music mix, or new music Friday or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Now they added the chill mix playlist. So I think the chill mix is Sundays, the favorites is Wednesdays, and the new music is Fridays. So it's just. Um, Different okay. types of music that you can listen to. I, I like it. I listen to both favorites and the new music. Don't really listen to the chill one. Um, now, it's not quite where Spotify is, but it's 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 pretty good sometimes. Um, I think it, you know it's better if you listen to more music through Apple Music. So as you use it more, it'll get better and better as, you, as it learns what you like. Right. And you have right, to right. love or dislike songs as well. So it knows, you know, if there's a song it, it suggests for you that you really don't like, dislike it, and then it will do better in the future mm -hmm. that's something i'm having to constantly yeah. tell myself it needs those data points it can't know otherwise yeah. communication is key in any relationship <laughs> <laughs> so true you have to tell your partner what you like and what you don't like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh man um and you can now follow your friends on apple music so you can sing speaking of relationships exactly 
um, <laughs> you can see what they're listening to and follow their their playlist that they've deemed public and shared with it. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you can connect your Apple Music profile to Facebook or Instagram. And so you can find other friends as you connect yours up with that as well. So I have like four, I know like four people who have this turned on. So I guess Apple Music isn't quite as popular as Spotify, at least amongst my friends, but. Right. Well, I'm, and I mean, if this is a brand new um, setting, maybe people just haven't noticed yet and haven't turned it on. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And the final app that's gotten some new uh, updates is the App Store app. So the biggest thing that I think that they have changed that I like is the separating of games and app categories. So now, like, your top charts before iOS 11 would just have everything. And now there's a top Mm -hmm. charts for games and a top chart for apps. And so games, you know, would take up all of the top charts anyway because all these freemium um, in-app purchase-based games would just be super popular and just I don't know, distort the whole ranking system. Right. So now it's separate. Right. They have two completely separate tabs. There's profiles and spotlights for apps and there's ones completely separately for other games. And I think that's great. Um, they now have a today tab, which kind of takes place of the featured tab where they have um, featured stories that uh, a team of editors and curators have written about cool apps. Um, mm. App viewing pages have gotten a little more, Um, updated so you can add some artwork to it Um, and now this might be a little more for larger apps I'm not sure if every app can do it but there's just more information you can put on the page and link to other things they've kind of redesigned I like that today I like that today concept because like I am so into you know like long form journalism about you know video games and stuff so yeah seeing seeing that kind of thing kind of featured in the app store that's that's phenomenal i think it makes the app store seem a little more artisanal yeah 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 um there's a new purchase dialogue so when you get an app either free or paid that looks much more like apple pay so i think that's kind of unifying the the format that users are expecting um and you can now view ipad and mac product pages from the iphone and in any other combination now i don't know if the uh, mac version can view other ones but um that's nice because I've I've often seen on Twitter, you know, someone links to some some cool new app and I tap it on my phone and, oh, it's iPad only. And I just see the icon and nothing else. But now you can mm-hmm. s- actually s- see and read about it a little bit. Nice. Nice. So um, if there's anything else you want to know about iOS 11, I would recommend the um, the complete, full, super detailed, in-depth review that Federico Vitici wrote on MacStories.net. There's a link in the show notes. Um, Fantastic. And if you want to know a little bit more about some of the devices that have iOS 11 on them, we did a review of the iPhone 8 Plus uh, a few episodes ago. Um, that was uh, Second Opinion number 29. And the next episode of Second Opinion, which we'll be releasing two weeks after this one, will be the iPhone 10. So be sure to stick around for, for that episode as well. Yeah. Brian. Where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me on Snapchat at uh, bman4789, where you can see my location all the time whenever I open the app. <laughs> you can also find me on Twitter at brianmitchl, or my website, brianm.me. What about you? And I am Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck, um, or you can check out my um, website, ianrbuck.com, where I have links to other stuff that I make. And uh, this this show, Second Opinion, is a production of The Nexus TV. You can find us on Twitter at The Nexus TV or send us an email at thenexustv at gmail.com. We would love to hear your feedback on like this particular episode, but also we would love to hear suggestions for other stuff that you want us to review. We do all kinds of stuff, you know, TV shows, movies, games, devices, whatever. Um, if you have something, you know, like a, a new phone or whatever that uh, you want to come on the show and review for us, we would love to have you. We'd love to have guests. Uh, and this this episode of the Second Opinion, as with every episode, is released under the Creative Commons Attribution License. So feel free to take any portion of this and use it however you like. Remix it. Yeah. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good one. Have a good one.